Good morning. My brothers and I would greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I would like to thank you for making every effort to be here with us, to worship together. And I would like to start by showing you something that I'm wearing. And if any of you know me, probably have never seen me in a decorative tie. Trace probably likes it. Trace has one. Yep. So I actually got this as a gift during Christmas, and this was from Kim Morgan's children that she is fostering. And it is a, uh, there's Christ in the center as a baby. And um, as I was making preparations for today, this thought came to mind that there is a newness in every day that we live. Just like the newness of Christ and what he did when he returned or when he came to this earth to join us in the flesh, just like the new year that we just celebrated, every day there's a newness and an opportunity to make a decision and to wake up and to choose. God gave us our agency from the very beginning. And every single day, we can wake up and we can choose. And we have a choice to either choose happiness, sadness, frustration, hate, and just like being baptized. We were renewed. We were given another opportunity to join him if we so choose. And my scripture reading will come out of Romans chapter 6, verse 4 through 6. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in a newness of life. For if we have been planted together in likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. May the Lord bless you this day. And we might take, take the opportunity for this newness of life, this newness of this day. Whether you woke up three, four, five, six hours ago, the same is going to happen tomorrow. We're going to have a newness, another opportunity to find joy and happiness. May the Lord bless you this day, and may you keep our brother Josh in your prayers, and each one of us as well.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day and the opportunity to gather together as a people. We pray that your spirit would be with us, and especially with Josh, that you might touch him, and that he might bring the message and the words that you desire of us to hear, that it might bring us closer in our walk with thee. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. for our offering. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time thanking you for this beautiful day you've given us. We pray that uh, the money that uh, is collected today would go for your purpose. It might be able to reach those that are in need, that are hurting. We pray that uh, as we go forth through this day and through our week that we might be able to come in contact with those people that are in need of you. Pray that uh, we might be that light that uh, would show your goodness and your mercy and your grace. Thank you for all the blessings that you've given us and pray that uh, we might be able to share those blessings with other people. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. My opening scripture will be Jeremiah, chapter 29, verses 11 through 14. And I will be found of you, says the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places, whither I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again and to the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Because ye have said the Lord have raised us up, prophets and... Um, sorry, lost my place. Let me start over. For I know your thoughts, and I know you think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then ye shall call unto me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places, whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring again unto you the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive.
morning, everyone. We welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, of course, it wouldn't be a uh, Josh Cunningham sermon if something went wrong right in the beginning. So uh, I blame my age. That's what I blame. I'm getting older, and uh, I meant to start at 11. I've read 14. So uh, when I started reading 15, I knew something was wrong. So um, what I want to talk about today, and of course, this time of the year, we all get together, and you know, whether it be work or home or personal, we start to think about you know, what are those New Year's resolutions that I look forward to in the new year? Well, I kind of want to put somewhat of a twist to that. Um, instead of looking at a New Year's resolution, maybe we look at a new beginning. But also that this new beginning doesn't have to start at the first of the year. That it could start in April, it can start in July, it can start in December. It's not something that has to be because we ring in the new year. So when I think about resolutions, I think about, you know, what I want to do with work, you know, what I want to do personally. But one thing I want to start off with is that God is with you each and every single day, each and every single month, each and every single year. We don't have to have a resolution for me to be closer to God because he's with us each and every day. I hope we came today to receive our Heavenly Father because I know when I stepped through those doors this morning, his hands were open wide, ready to receive us. So I take it fills my heart with joy to know that it doesn't matter what path I'm on, it doesn't matter what road I've taken, that my Heavenly Father is with me. And that's for each and every one of us as we start this new year. So when I look back at 2022 and um, what things happened and, you know, what good things, things that could have changed, you know, first thing that um, comes to my mind, and I was thinking, you know, next year will be 20 years since I came to Parkview. And, you know, you think about how long 20 years takes, you know, from today, but it doesn't really take that long. Um, I was 17 years old, and um, I had just came from a, a camp, a retreat, uh, and I, you know, I'd met Jessica at a camp previously that summer, and we just happened to go to the same retreat. And Bethany had asked me if I would be willing to uh, talk at a Halloween service that was going to be here at Parkview. And uh, I said, of course, absolutely. And so I actually came to uh, that service and Ryan Reynolds, uh, Ryan, Ryan, Ryan Nichols, <laughs> I'm sure he'll find that funny. Ryan Nichols is actually leading, leading the service and it was a wonderful service on Halloween and uh, we actually had a reception downstairs, and I actually remember probably talking to my mother-in-law more that night than I was than I talked to my wife that night because Julie had gone to Fort Osage, I was going to Fort Osage, so um, it was nice. But um, you know, other things that I look back at this year, you know, we got Jessica and I got the opportunity to start doing camps again, and this was our second year that. We got to help out with a camp. And, you know, when you sit and you look at the world today and you look at things today, you get worried that, okay, is Christ getting further and further away? But, you know, when I go to these camps and I see these, these young kids, you know, and, and camp I was at was fourth to sixth graders, you know, they desire to be with their Heavenly Father. At such a young age, they desire to be with their Heavenly Father. And that's what, you know, gives me hope that, you know, when I see the world crumbling beside me, that there's still that hope. There's still that generation ready to take that next step. And I know Aaron, when he preached, he talked about camp. And I know for myself, you know, what I wanted for each and every camper that came to camp each and every one of those years 
was that they had that personal testimony, that they had that testimony that when times got hard on their own, that they were able to hold on to that, to know that their Heavenly Father is there. I know for myself, you know, whether I was in another foreign country or wherever I may be, that when times got rough, I would hold back onto those experiences I had. And I prayed that each and every time those campers would have that same testimony. Um, one of the other great things that happened this year is we got to welcome um, our new nephew uh, into this world. Uh, Jacqueline um, had a, uh, a baby. He was a preemie, um, but he's doing, he's doing really well. And it made me sit back and remember my experience when Cooper was born. Um, Cooper was born in April, and, um, you know, they said that, all right, well, you know, if he's not here by the due date, we're going to induce due date came and we're going to induce. So, you know, in Josh Cunningham's mind, um, what I think of induced is, all right, you take a shot, you have a shot, you have a baby, we'll have a baby by nine o'clock. You know, we got there at seven, take a shot, we have a baby by nine. Didn't quite work out that way. Um, And we actually um, didn't actually probably start until probably about six o'clock at night. Uh, Cooper was born um, about 8.30 that night, and um, everything was great. You know, you get through the busyness of everything, nurses running around, and um, they went and they checked Jessica's temperature, and it was sky high. So um, they checked it again, and it was still sky high. So because of that, uh, Cooper had to be put into the NICU for 48 hours. Well, what was important to Jessica and I is that, you know, we get him administered to um, before we did that. And the nurses were open to that. The only thing they said is we can't start the 48-hour clock until we actually get him there. So, but it was still important to us that, you know, that we had the elders there and do that. So I, um, it was late at night, and I didn't know if anyone was going to pick up, but I called Trace and Trace came up and was able to administer to Cooper before we um, put him in the NICU. And he didn't have any issues. Um, I think what was probably harder in that whole experience was being in the NICU and being next to, next to a baby that was only three pounds. And seeing the, the parents that were trying to have the strength while they get through that or... Or seeing the joy of the parents that were actually getting to leave the NICU because their child passed the car seat test. So, um, you know, if there's anything I can always suggest, um, you know, you can always call the elders no matter when it is. Um, I know that they'd be willing to, um, to come at a moment's notice. Now, looking forward to 2023, um, for me, I'm, I'm more of a person, I like to look like five years down the road, not necessarily a year down the road, but um, I've had 2023 marked for for years when I became a father because I knew that was the year that his son would be able to uh, go into the waters of baptism. And um, even though I wasn't in the priesthood at the time, I still held on to that hope that I would be the one that would get to do that. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, um, to that um, this year, and also um, the opportunity of um, being called to elder, taking that next step in, in this path that um, our wonderful Father has for us. Now, I wrote down some of my New Year's resolutions. I know everyone has their own, so I thought I would share some of my New Year's resolutions. Um, first one was, listen to my wife. Um, now I'll probably tell you, I'll probably break that today when I'm at home watching football, 
Um, so probably not the best New Year's resolution. Um, my second New Year resolution is to watch Kansas City Chiefs in a, another Super Bowl this year. And my third is to watch the Sooners dominate college again. So those are my New Year's resolutions. Now, some of them may be containable. I hope the Chiefs are. We'll see about the Sooners. But, um, you know, everyone has their own New Year's resolutions. Um, I know, like, with work, you know, you have your goals. Um, you know, it's usually when you have these meetings. Hey, this is where you'd like to be. Where I work, we don't do that because our New Year starts in October. So we're already almost halfway through our, our first half of the year already. So... What does the scriptures tell us about New Year's resolutions? Um, Proverbs 16.9, a man's heart desires his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. Colossians 3.14-17, and above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfect, perfectiveness, and let the peace of God rule in your heart to that which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, and the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in the words or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And Second Corinthians Chapter 5, verses 17. Therefore, if any man live in Christ, he is new, creative old things that are passed away. Behold, these things pass away. Behold, all things become new. So, as I said kind of earlier, you know, I look at New Year's as a new beginning. You know, I sit back and I look at those things. All right, I could have done these things better. You know, when I look at work and I look at some of the blessings I've had from work, you know, I had a, at a time this year or last year, I was our only escalating officer. Um, we had about 100,000 pending cases and we had, you know, roughly probably about 30 escalating officers amongst everyone in the United States. I was the only one for my office at this time because all our other officers were doing other tasks. So I would be getting basically a phone call from somebody that's probably waited two to three days for their emergency. And of course, it's the human thing that, you know, their emergency is their emergency and they don't care about anything else. They don't know that, you know, I've talked to 20 people who've had the same emergency, but to them, it's the most important thing. So when you explain to them, all right, well, you know, I got to reach out to said office. I got to see if they're willing to open up the appointment. They may or they may not. I mean, you begin to learn who your, you know, who your trouble offices are, who's your offices that are willing to work with you. And you begin to, you know, work through their issues. And I know for myself, what I eventually came to is I was just getting beat down every single day because you get yelled at and, you know, stress was just building up because for like me, I want to help everybody, but I know that I have no control. I'm just the messenger. So, um, I got the chance to lead a team in July of, of last year, which it really was a blessing because I was able to get away from that and, you know, focus on, a different side of what I do and it you know it's just it's great how you know the Lord puts things in front of you when you need it the most so um, resolution is defined as a noun as a firm decision to do or not to do something so um, also a cinnamon intention resolve decision intent Aim, aspiration, or design. Also, the quality of being determined or resolute. Um, now, there's not a verb, I guess, for resolution. I wouldn't be able to explain first why that is. That's something my wife would be able to probably explain. But I have no idea why it's not a verb. There was no verb for it. Um, now, 
to truly start a new beginning, you must have a change of heart. You know, um, one of the most common things we all know is, you know, the biggest time for a gym membership is the beginning of the year. That's everyone's resolution. And, you know, if you go to the gym, it's stock pack in January. But then usually towards February, middle of February, it goes back to what it, what it was. Um, so, but if you want to start a new beginning, you first must have that change of heart. If you truly want a new beginning, then you need to change a couple of things. And what that changes is in your heart and in your mind. We, most of us, you know, we rely on ourselves to accomplish those goals. But do we rely on God to accomplish those goals? You know, when I, told, when I was at the camps, I always told the kids each and every time, you know, pray before you have a test. I know I did it, and I was a, you know, A, B kind of student. You know, when I sat in chemistry for the first time, and that chemistry teacher told me, hey, if uh, you normally make an A in science, you're going to make a B in my class. You make a B, you're going to make a C, and uh, anyone below that, best of luck. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm... I'm going to have the worst time in this class. And I struggled. And luckily, I, I got a C. So I was very happy with my C. But, I mean, each test that I took, I'm like, please, God, don't make me fail this. You know, but it's the same thing where I said, you know, you're deciding where to go to college. Take that to God. You know, when it comes time to seek, you know, a relationship where you're going to marry that individual, go to God. See, sometimes the world tells us that, you know, God's not real, that, you know, it's something that, you know, ministers will profit off of, that, um, he, he's, he, you know, it's something that your parents tell you and they expect you to carry it on. Well, the thing I know for sure is, is that God is real. He's here today. It's not a fairy tale, but he's here, and he's ready to listen to you. And if you seek that personal testimony of him, and if you go to him with a contrite spirit and an open heart, he will give you that testimony. You know, I found it interesting when uh, Neil said that, you know, when he talked to someone about the Book of Mormon, he tells them to read the last chapter of the Book of Mormon first because it talks about, you know, that promise to understand if these words are true. And I, I've never thought about that, but I know if I definitely talk to someone next time, I think I'm going to suggest that because it makes a lot of sense um, while you're reading it to first seek if these words are true. So when I was, um, when I was studying A New Beginning, uh, I came across some seven steps that Billy Graham had outlined that I'd like to share with you now. Uh, the first step was a new relationship. So if we have a new beginning, you have a new relationship. You know, each of us had different times when we were baptized, when we went to the water baptism, that we started that relationship with God. But kind of like I was saying, you know, <coughs> Each of us have times where we're on the path and we fall off the path. But it doesn't matter where we're at. We can start that new relationship. Uh, I found this one pretty interesting. Um, he called it a new citizenship. And he said, the th second thing God gives you when you commit your life to Christ is a new citizenship. You are still a citizen of a particular country, but you are also a citizen of the kingdom of God. As long as we are on earth, we possess dual citizenship. One, on one hand, we owe our allegiance to our nation and are called to be a good citizen, but we are also a citizen of kingdom of God that is invisible, a kingdom of which Christ is the head. Our supreme loyalty is to him, and, so, and if someone demand we do wrong, we must obey God rather than man. 
Next one was a new family. Not only does God give us a new relation, he gives them himself and makes us citizens of his kingdom, but he also gives us a new family, the family of God. You know, when I look back at all my times that I've had within the church, um, from growing up to what I am now, it's definitely been a family. Um, I cherish those relationships um, that I've had with people my age, but also people who are older, who are younger. Um, I enjoyed my almost 10 years of being able to witness um, a lot of your children um, go through camp and um, experience those things on their own and um, to hear their wonderful testimonies and just to be a part of that just um, brought joy to my, my life. Um, the next one is a new purpose. You know, when you start a new beginning, you have a new purpose. And second, people are very focused on using all their energies to reach their goals. Others drift through life with little purpose or direction, living for a moment and never thinking about where they are headed. So next one is a new power. So, you know, when you think about, you know, that power you have where I can go to somebody each and every single day, night or day, that's what gives me comfort. You know, if there's, a, if there's a, a New Year's resolution I could have, it would be to pray in the morning each and every day, pray in the evening. I know each and every night before I go to bed is typically when I do pray. But when you wake up and you start your day with prayer, or if you start your day with reading, you know, a devotion or a scripture, you know, it just helps your day move forward better. Um, at least that's what I've, I've experienced. A new destiny. The word conversion means change, and the most radical change uh, of all is when we come to Christ. It's that God gives us his new destiny. And the last is a new journey. And again, you know, I, I keep going back to it, but our journeys can begin any time. It doesn't matter where we're at in life. God never goes away from us. God is always there. So it doesn't matter if I'm 45 years old or if I'm 12 years old. My journey can begin, and it can begin again, and it can begin again. But that's why our Heavenly Father loves us, and that's why he has his hands open all the time for us to come back to him because he's no, he knows we're going to falter and we're going to fail. He, but that's why he gives our agency because if we all if we all – if we never failed, then we'd never know what that felt like. Now, one of the things I want to talk about next is a new beginning that happened to the Nephites. There was a man whose name was Samuel, who was a Lamanite. Now, there's some that believe that Samuel came from the descendants of the people of Ammon, we, we don't actually know if that is the case or not. Um, it doesn't state in, in the Book of Mormon where Samuel came from. Um, it, it's possible that that's where he did come from. That's, you know, that's who at the time were the righteous Lamanites. But there were also other Lamanites that were righteous. But uh, Samuel was called to go to Zarahemla to give a message. Now, First, Samuel traveling to Zarahemla um, was dangerous in itself because, you know, Lamanites were the enemy, and Nephites couldn't typically tell the difference between a good Lamanite and an enemy. So when Ammon and the son of Mosiah brought the Lamanites up to the land of Zarahemla, and they were met by Alma II, um, Moroni purposely put them on the, on the east side of the land so that there wouldn't be, you know, someone that would hurt them not knowing that who they are. So um, when Samuel went to Zarahemla, he made it to Zarahemla, and he actually went into the city to find that the city was very wicked and was not in a, in a good place. Now, Nephi was the prophet or the head of the church at the time, but he hadn't actually been in Zarahemla 
that much. In fact, um, when Samuel came to Zarahemla, uh, his great grandfather Alma II had been had been gone for sixty seven years. His father. He, his grandfather, Helaman, had been gone for 52 years, and his father, 34 years. Now, at the time, they had been fighting many wars, and Captain Moroni, the great warrior, chief captain of the army, he died in his 40s, as did Helaman, and many of those had been because of the wounds they'd received during the, the constant battling. So, Nephi was given the plates by his uncle, and he actually also took over the judgment seat. And Nephi actually followed the steps of his, of his great-grandfather when he stepped down from the judgment seat to go south with his brother to preach the word to the Lamanites. And when they got down into that land... They are actually met the same way that the sons of Mosiah were met, and they're actually thrown into prison. And upon being thrown into prison, they were condemned to die. And when they were brought out to die, an angel of the Lord appeared unto them, and they were not killed. And because of this, many of the Lamanites laid down their arms and turned to Christ. After this, Nephi then returns to north to preach, where he is met again, and he's, many of the people rejected what he said, and he returned to Zarahemla at this point. And this was in 61, the reign of the judges. And he started to notice, he was just gone eight years, but notice that Ganeans and robbers were running around creating chaos. And when he returned, and when he had returned, his first step was trying to get the church going. But because so many of the people had been turned away from God, he started to find that very difficult. And that's when Samuel then approached, begins to approach the city. And he climbs up to the top of the wall because when he went into the city, he was immediately thrown out. So he climbs to the top of the wall and he begins to give this message to the people. And part of that message was that in 400 years, then if the Nephites don't change their ways, they're going to die. And this message was before Christ came. And that other part of that message was the coming of Christ. And many of the people began to reject what Samuel was saying. How is it this Lamanite is going to tell us how to act? But there were few that had their new beginning that day. There were few that went and sought Nephi so that they could be baptized. Some of the things that Alma, or not Alma, I'm sorry, some of the things that Samuel said to the people was that, but as many of you were who did not believe in the words of Samuel were angry with him, they cast stones upon him, and so many shot arrows at him as they stood upon the wall. But as many did believe on his words, went forth and sought Nephi. And when they come forth and they found him, they confessed unto them their sins and denied not, desiring that they may be baptized unto the Lord. Now, it was five years before Christ would come at this point. But many, after witnessing arrows being shot, now I know for me, if I'm sitting here and I'm watching someone get arrows shot at them and they're still standing there and they're going to the side, I'm pretty sure I'd be, oh, I'm a believer, done, you know, no, no need for it. Hey, Nephi, you come baptize me right now. But because of the hardness of the hearts of these people and also likely the influence of the Ganeantan robbers, Many still didn't believe, and eventually Samuel would go away. Now, the thing is with Samuel, he went away and was never heard of again. We don't know where he went. Now, many do believe that he was one of the, the wise men that would go over and present gifts to, um, to Jesus when he was born. But five years later, Nephi would also depart. 
and be never heard of again. So it took Zarahemla, the city of God, where the Nephites have reigned, where the chief judge has been, where Alma was the judge, Alma the second was the judge, Nephi was the judge, his grandfather was the judge, his father was. They, they kept it in line, but it took eight years for it to fall and be in the state it is. But many of those people would hold on and they'd be baptized and their new beginning would start. But then what would happen in the end is when that sign came, they held on to that faith, knowing and trusting what Samuel had said. And those things did come true. And eventually what Samuel said, 400 years later, the Nephites would be killed and destroyed. In my last sermon, um, I read a chorus of a song. And um, the song comes from the song called The Call. It's by Larry Jordan, who was um, started the Brother John singing group. And at the time, um, that's when Aaron Taylor, who was a member of that group, had passed away. And I remember as a, a kid getting to... Uh, to listen to um, them sing, and it was always amazing each and every time. And I never heard, at least my memory, I, I never, I don't remember Larry singing the song. It was always usually his son that sang the song. But um, I'd like to read um, the full song. From the beginning until the end, my joy, my glory, to be your friend. To go together through eternity, there with my Father, what joy there'll be. I ran the race, I fought the fight, I am the way, the truth, and the light. I paid the price so that you could be free, I gave you everything, what will you give to me? I've seen your struggles. I felt your pain. I know your sorrows dark in the rain. I'll take your heartache, sadness and strife, and give you peace for the rest of your life. I ran the race. I fought the fight. I am the way, the truth, and the light. I paid the price so that you could be free. I gave you everything. What will you give to me? I'll hear your sorrows. I'll smooth your pain. Give you sunny tomorrow, rainbows through the rain. Keep my commandments. I am the way. If you go with me, then do what I say. Can you hear me calling? Can you hear my voice? Can you hear me pleading? As you make your choice, my oak is easy, my burden is a light. If we walk together, everything is all right. I gave you everything. What will you give to me? What will you give to me? My closing scripture comes from the fourth chapter of Nephi. Chapter 4, verses 48. And this is Christ himself talking. I am the light and the life of the world. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. It starts with Christ. It ends with Christ. Wherever you're at in your journey, his hands are open, wide, ready to receive you. And there's anything I can promise this day is that your Heavenly Father loves you. Your Heavenly Father is ready to receive you. Your Heavenly Father is ready to listen. No matter what time of the day.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to hear your word and to come unto you and worship this day. I would ask that you would go with us, that we would be um, continue to be blessed throughout our day and the week ahead, that the struggles that we face um, would be insignificant when we give them unto you, that you would help us and that we would be able to rely on you. And as we look forward to this new year and those new promises and goals um, that we've set for ourselves, help it to be um, strengthening of our relationship with you and with others, that we can continue to be blessed and guided as a people towards one common goal. We thank you for your love in all things. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.